I'm Sabrina, an incoming first year medical student at the University of Chicago. I've spent the past year working in health policy research in Washington, DC. And so in this video, I hope to share some of what I've learned and what I'm currently working on. I'll introduce some high level concepts and definitions in health policy, review some ongoing debates, and finally briefly touch upon some of the implications of the COVID-19 pandemic on future policymaking. I know that understanding the US healthcare system can be intimidating to pretty much anyone. So the topics that I cover in this video are relevant and applicable to a broad audience. That said, this video is part of my med school application series since health policy topics come up fairly often in med school interviews and even in some secondary application essays. So if you are a pre-med student, I hope that you find this video especially helpful, not just as you apply for med school, but also as you prepare for a career in medicine where your work and practice will be affected by these policies pretty much every single day. I've cited all of my sources and linked some resources for further reading in the description box below, but please let me know if you have any questions or comments. I would love to hear from you. Let's get started with some basic concepts and definitions. So the first term that I want to define is the word payer. When someone goes to see a physician, they usually aren't paying for everything by themselves or out of pocket. They usually have a health insurance plan that helps them cover at least some of the costs. So the word payer refers to the entities that cover those costs, the entities that pay in part for the health care of an insured individual. Payers include private health insurance companies like Blue Cross Blue Shield or United Health, but the government is also a payer since it runs Medicare and Medicaid to public health insurance programs for specific populations within the United States. I'm gonna go into Medicaid and Medicare in a little bit more detail later in this video. Even if you have health insurance coverage though, you typically aren't home free. In order to access your healthcare benefits, individuals often have to buy into the program by paying a small fee each month to their health insurance company. This fee is called a premium and it's due to the insurance company regardless of whether or not you saw a physician or healthcare provider that month. When a patient actually goes to see a healthcare provider, they often have to pay a copay or deductible, which is a fee due to the healthcare provider themselves at the time of the appointment. So now that we have that out of the way, the next concept I want to define is the idea of employer-sponsored health insurance. This is an arrangement in which an employer researches and selects a health plan, one that is offered by a private health insurance company like Blue Cross Blue Shield, and offers this health plan to its employees and their immediate relatives as a benefit of employment. Usually, your employer will split the cost of the premiums with you, and your premium payments can be deducted out of your paycheck automatically pre-tax, um, which lowers your taxable income and increases your take-home income. Since everyone at the company has the same health insurance plan, you do get less choice in an employer-sponsored healthcare arrangement than you would if you were purchasing your own healthcare for yourself as an individual. The majority of Americans, a little over 50%, receive healthcare from their employer. And just to fill out the rest of the pie chart, around a third of the U.S. population receives health care from public sources, around 18% through Medicare and around 18% through Medicaid. Around 10% purchased their health insurance individually through the individual marketplace and subtracting the very small percentage of individuals on military health insurance plans that leaves around 9% of the U.S. population that is uninsured. This equates to around 28 million people. So I've mentioned these programs a few times already, so let's talk about Medicare and Medicaid. The idea of a government-run health insurance program was first proposed in the FDR era, but it wasn't until 1965 with President Lyndon Johnson that the Medicare bill was passed through Congress. Uh, this bill essentially established a federal program providing health insurance for all Americans over the age of 65, regardless of income and regardless of prior medical history. Medicaid, on the other hand, is an insurance program for low-income Americans, the disabled, and children. Medicare, which is a federal program, Medicaid is administered through a state and federal partnership. So the federal government gives states money to fund their Medicaid program, and the states themselves get a lot of leeway in deciding what populations are eligible and what services that they're going to cover. The federal government does mandate that every state cover the disabled, pregnant women, and children, but there's quite a bit of variability from state to state in terms of what income threshold would qualify you for Medicaid. In summary, Medicaid is a state-federal partnership covering low-income Americans, and Medicare is a federal program covering America's seniors. 
but I know the names can be a little bit confusing. So the way that I like to remember it is Medicare is caring for the elderly and Medicaid is federal aid for low income individuals. So now that we've introduced some high level concepts about the US healthcare system, let's talk about some of the ongoing debates and problems that we're facing. The first major debate is about our insurance system. If you've paid any attention to politics over the past few years, this is the debate that you've probably heard the most about. When people call for single payer or Medicare for all, this is what they're talking about. Before I get into the proposals that are on the table though, I want to get into why we're having this debate in the first place. At the crux of all of these proposals is the idea that we want to get more people on health insurance, that the 28 million people that are currently uninsured should have some sort of coverage. So why does it matter so much that people have health insurance? While the evidence is pretty overwhelming that health insurance increases access to regular preventative care and that this care is life-saving, states that have more expansive Medicaid programs, that is programs that cover more people, perform better on a wide range of health indicators. There's lower infant mortality and higher life expectancy when compared to states with more restrictive Medicaid programs. And mortality goes down when states expand Medicaid. In a 2012 study published by the New England Journal of Medicine, looking at Arizona, Maine, and New York after they expand Medicaid, these three states saw a 6.1% reduction in all-cause mortality, the equivalent of 19.6 less deaths per 100,000 adults. Beyond mortality and outcomes, some researchers also argue that increased coverage reduces healthcare costs as well. It's cheaper to prevent a disease, for instance, than it is to treat it. But the research on that is still not quite settled, so I'll leave it at that. So recognizing this problem, the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, made a bunch of legislative changes to expand healthcare coverage in the United States. In brief, it allowed states to expand their Medicaid programs to include more people and provided federal funding to support this expansion. It required small employers, small companies to provide employer-based health insurance to their employees. Finally, in the controversial individual mandate, it required that individuals get health insurance through the individual marketplace or face a penalty. I'm happy to do another video on the ACA. If you have questions about that, just let me know in the comments below. So given that it's important that people are insured and not enough people are, what type of healthcare system would allow us to expand coverage in the United States? I won't have time to go over all the proposals in depth, but I'll briefly review the two central conflicting ideas. The first idea is to create a single payer system, in other words, a national form of insurance that's run by the government where all healthcare providers are reimbursed by that one payer. The Medicare for All proposal, in which everyone is covered by Medicare, falls under this category. In, in its purest form, Medicare for All would also entail that we would eliminate private health insurance companies and employer-sponsored health insurance plans. There's debate over whether eliminating all private health insurance plans is necessary, and there's also a debate over whether we would pay for this by raising taxes or asking enrollees to pay premiums. The other big proposal on the table is to create what's called a public option, allowing individuals that are currently uninsured or on the individual marketplace to buy into Medicare or Medicaid, a government-sponsored health insurance plan. The public option would not eliminate employer-sponsored health insurance or other forms of private health insurance. The second major problem in the U.S. healthcare system is cost. This country spends so, so much on healthcare. In 2018, the U.S. spent 16.9% of gross domestic product GDP on healthcare. That is almost two times more than the average of the OECD countries. And costs are high because of a couple of reasons. First, private health insurance companies are really bad at negotiating prices. In the U.S., unlike other countries, the government doesn't fix the, the price of drugs or tests or other services. Instead, payers or insurers negotiate with hospitals and providers to get the best possible price for their members. And since there are so many private insurance companies, each covering such a small subset of the U.S. population, they don't have a ton of weight to throw around in that negotiation process. In contrast, Medicare and Medicaid have a lot more bargaining power and are extremely effective negotiators. Remember, each program accounts for around 18% of the U.S. population. So if a hospital refuses to name a good price for a certain test or a certain service, the hospital loses out on a ton of business. Those Medicaid and Medicare patients won't go to that hospital for that specific test or service. A recent study by the Kaiser Family Foundation reported that private insurers pay around two times more than Medicaid for the exact same test or service, and a lot of those costs get passed down to the individual patient themselves. This stands in contrast with other countries where the government negotiates on the behalf of all citizens and publishes a master list of prices that providers and hospitals must adhere to each year. 
But the high spending in the US healthcare system doesn't just have to do with how much we're paying for each service or drug, it also has to do with how we're incentivizing providers. Most of the US operates under what's called a fee-for-service system, in which providers charge for each test or service performed. There's also often little to no coordination across different providers. For example, if you break your arm, you might get a separate bill from your radiologist, your orthopedic surgeon, and your physical therapist, with little to no incentive for these physicians to coordinate to ensure the best outcome for you as a patient. To combat this, many researchers and health policy professionals are trying to advance what's called a value-based payment system, or VBP. Other than charging for each individual service, physicians are reimbursed based on the quality and value of their care. There are a wide range of value-based payment models ranging from state governments giving providers financial bonus payments when they achieve high quality patient outcomes to what's called a global budget in which hospitals are given a block sum to manage the care of a certain population of people. This block sum is meant to cover the cost of all of the care that individuals need and hospitals are able to basically pocket what they don't spend. Through this, hospitals are incentivized to really keep people healthy and keep them out of the hospital. Hospitals under value-based payment arrangements have also started investing in the social determinants of health like housing or food insecurity, recognizing that these social determinants have a huge impact on people's health outcomes. Of course, there's no way I can talk about the US healthcare system without addressing the vast inequities in health and healthcare in this country. There are huge disparities in health and life outcomes across race, gender, geography, and income. And there's also evidence that health disparities are getting worse. A recent article published in JAMA Network Open, drawing from annual health survey data published by the CDC from 1993 to 2017, found that race, gender, and income were stronger predictors of health outcomes in 2017 than they were in 1993. Further, the income disparity in health outcomes has widened in the past 20 years. And you need to look no further than the COVID-19 pandemic to see the effect of racial and ethnic disparities in health and healthcare in this country. This pandemic is not an equalizer and is disproportionately affecting communities of color. For example, in Washington, D.C., African Americans make up only 46.4% of the total population, but account for 77% of all COVID-19 deaths. These disparities only emphasize the importance of investing in the social determinants of health and the importance of having healthcare professionals that are actively combating these disparities, both in the bigger picture and in their interpersonal interactions with patients. Finally, I want to briefly go over the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on healthcare policy. So Congress has passed two bills, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act and the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security Act, big names. And these acts have required all private health insurance companies, as well as Medicare and Medicaid, to cover testing for COVID-19 and waive all co-pays and deductibles for testing services during the public health emergency. Though not strictly required by these pieces of legislation, several private health insurance companies, including Humana, Cigna, United Health, and Blue Cross Blue Shield, have also waived any co-payments and deductibles for treatment of COVID-19 for their members. In addition to expanding coverage for services related to COVID-19, the pandemic has also led to expanded coverage for telehealth visits, as many people are opting to see providers through a virtual visit as opposed to going in person. The pandemic has also increased scrutiny of our employer-based healthcare system, with so many people losing their jobs, millions of people filing for unemployment each week. People are questioning whether it makes sense to have healthcare tied to your employment status. So that's it for me. <laughs> Thanks for making it to the end. This video was a really quick overview of a very complex topic. So please let me know if anything wasn't clear or if you'd like me to make another video, I'd love to talk about this some more. <laughs> See you next time.